the amber waves are thick and warm, and on the gardens to the drums of shade. While thoughts of beauty pass all which for the bright year light to day. So spent the many days of pink life, and on the street are by the mill's bright fire, the wind and winds have hold of a distant flight, still bade us for the moment of your desire, to face to heal the moment day, and you did not aspire. Returning here, no harvest fields I've seen, nor a rest of beauty of the thought from here. Where is the honey of the city bee? No leaves upon the smoky stream appear. The housekeeper is getting his bed, the lecture is showy as lots of sewing. I hear of me or somebody, the pole, and the rooster Lyo, called Lost Girl, is home. But not a breath of buckle or posy, is any social impulse to me. But many care, sad thoughts of men are wise. Base buildings and unrising destinies, hopes of uninterrupted and unhollow ties. We hear the sun smiles sweet as heavenly love upon the heat of earthly severance. The new planets in their clouds blow all above, and earth lies steeped in odors and trees. The moon looks down as though she never could have viewed us. In this last trembling new side, you see if you see us? Surely some life is living in this light, pure than mine, some solar sea last night. I cannot surely take this previous day. Does thy heart not swell to hell that you can be alright? I would not nature of these last loving words in your name, should say. Thank you. All right, let's talk about this poem. Based on your close reading, what did you discover about this poem based on what you learned about Margaret Fuller on Friday? Yes. And I definitely have some of that transcendental, like, love of nature, right? Good. And a bit of that, like, spirituality connect, intertwined with nature. Good. And remember, transcendental love of, nat love of nature, right, is that nature is in charge, right? Mm -hmm. And we are just kind of in nature. Good. Yes. Uh, the poem shows that because the earth blew the fact that um, all of the sort of like imagery pieces are these like natural wonders and beauties. Um, even in the first stanza, when we have these like all of these like negative visions of the things that we don't have, like the negation of these things, like um, nature refuses us, smiles and kindly airs. The sun, but rarely deigned a pallid gleam. We have these like um, these visions of what nature can do that are predated by nature is not doing these things at this time. And then in the third stanza, you have the inversion of all of those things. You have the sun smiling sweet, the tender clouds, the moon looking down, the last trembling leaves, which are all direct inversions of the things that all of those things are not doing in the first part of the first one. Good, very good. Other observations? And feel free to use poetic terminology, yes. Uh, the second stanza is interrupted by like, a lot of commas, and it doesn't have any, uh, oh god, the, the lines like end at the end of the line. Uh, they're, there's, like, no so they're end stop. Yeah, they're in salt lines. There's no enjambment? Yeah, there's no enjambment. Good. Yeah, I forgot that word, but. It's okay. Um, it, it makes it seem a lot more plain than the first and the last stanza, which has a lot of enjambments, and uh, it flows really well. Meanwhile, this one's like interrupted. It's very uh, static. -y. Good. Very good. Other observations? Anything you're observing about um, Fuller's actual uh, life and poetics that you learned from Friday's lecture, because now we need to be at the point in um, learning about poetry that we take what we learn and apply it to the actual poem, like you're going to do in your paper, which is a reminder are due on Saturday, 11 59 p.m. Metaphor, simile. Consonants, syllabics, anyone observing anything? Yes. I noticed that there's a lot of personification and also the use of like pronouns. Um, like it talks about how nature smiles at us, but also it talks about how the moon is represented as a female character. And I really like, I don't know if like, this is just kind of like my interpretation, but it almost seems as if the moon is kind of like a ref like representation of herself. And so being able to kind of see what's going on in that sort of way. And I just think it's interesting that they choose to represent the moon as a female and that the pronouns are always connected to that kind of femininity. Good. Yeah, well, dating back to Sappho, the moon has been a feminine um, character. Um, it's personified as feminine, so that's awesome. So she could be echoing back to her foremothers and that. Very good. 
I like that you pointed out the personification as well. Good job. Yeah. Um, bouncing off that idea of the, the, the sort of feminine characteristics of the natural world in the second stanza, you also have it, the second stanza is very masculine and it's very like um, I don't know if industrial is the right industrial is the right word or, or like maybe like urban. Um, urban good word for it. Yeah, yeah. You, you have these like uh, all of these tough uh, like these hard phrases, uh, these like hard consonant sounds, and all of these like male uh, male and human characters. You have the housekeeper getting his cold, the lecturer, his show, his thoughts selling, Major Somebody, and Mr. Lyle. Um, they're all giving these like these like city uh, elements that are what presumably are causing all the nature the natural elements to not be able to do their things in that first stanza. Good. And I like how you brought up the cacophony, right? Yeah. As opposed to the euphonic last stanza. So Cacophonous is when something is, you know, grating and not as fluid in its sound versus euphonic is where it's flowing smoothly, right? Something that stood out to me, I know that it, we talked about how, um, I believe was it her, was it, did she have the baby, like the kid who died in a shipwreck with her husband? Well, she also died. Well, she also died? Yeah, they okay. all died in a shipwreck. So it could be about that, unless okay. she was like, a time traveler, yeah, which right. is possible, right? Yeah, I also um, think that there could be something, because like uh, the youthful tender clouds were interesting, because it's almost as if, like when I'm reading in the last stanza, it almost seems as if it's talking about like the progression of age, so it's like the sun starts first, and then it goes to like children, and then the moon, so it's kind of like this weird progression of like growing older, which is interesting. Good, I like that, very good. All right, well the, I like that some of the people are participating in this discussion. Let's get, let's move towards all the people participating in the discussion, okay? So don't be afraid to talk in class. The idea is that if you feel comfortable talking about it here, it'll be easier to talk about it on the page, okay? So do your homework, be prepared to talk so that it feels good to like know how to talk about, you know, feel fluent in these terms. Then when you're writing, you're like, Euphony, stanza, metaphor, no problem, okay? You'll be fluent, all right? You can also come talk to me in office hours in poetic language talk. We can talk in that language and then you'll feel more comfortable, okay? Or if you wanna think through some of the ideas. So um, I was gonna have you guys do, do a short writing prompt on this, but I'm gonna move on to um, Helen Hunt Jackson today. Um, because I don't want to miss out on this amazing Western woman as I claim. She's a Western writer because she spent so much time in the West, but she was actually born in the East. So Helen Hunt Jackson uh, grew up from, she was born in 1830 in Amherst, Massachusetts, and she lived to 1885, uh, which is a rather long life for someone in this century. She's the daughter of Nathan Welby um, Fisk, and Deborah Waterman Vinyl Fisk. Um, her father was a minister and an author, but he was, most importantly, he was a professor, he was a classics professor, professor of Latin, Greek, and philosophy at Amherst College. You see some overlap with um, uh, Fuller, Margaret Fuller? You'll notice there's overlap in their bio biographies, which is important. There's certain, there were certain elements that made it possible for women to become educated during this time period. Um, she had two brothers, both of whom died soon after birth, and a sister named Anne. Her parents were really strict Calvinists, which is a form of Puritan, Puritanism, um, and she rebelled against that, so her poetry is often both radical and conservative, but when she was a child, she was completely against the ideas of, oh, no, oh no, okay. The ideas of her parents, I know none of you were ever that way. Um, so when she was younger, she was a, a contemporary of Emily Dickinson. So they played together when they were little kids. But that they didn't know they were both going to be poets at that time, right? Uh, but they did play together. Um, her mother died from tuberculosis, which was a really common way to die during this time period um, because there was no antibiotics. Um, she died in 1844. And then three years later, um, her father died. So she was 14 when her mother died, 17 when her father died. Luckily, he had left a great deal of money for her to be educated. Um, and so she went to live with her aunt and uncle, 
um, but she was sent away also to boarding school. So she attended the Ipswich Female Seminary and the Abbott Institute, which is a boarding school in New York City, that Lavinia um, Dickinson, Emily Dickinson's sister, also attended. Um, and she married Edward Hunt in 1852. They traveled a great deal because he was in the military, and she called this lifestyle her scatterdom, which I think that's a great word for that. Uh, so they constantly have to set up house in new places. Um, but in 1855, uh, they moved to Rhode Island, and that's where she really began to establish herself as a writer in the literary community. She started attending these um, salons, literary salons. Remember I talked a little bit about those last week? Um, so she started attending these and really um, started publishing under the name HH. She never published under her name um, her, in this time period. Um, then in 1863, tragedy struck her. Um, her, her husband was working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and he was an officer and he was testing his own invention, which was a torpedo, and he died. Um, and she also had two sons um, with him. However, soon after her husband died, they also died. Neither one of them lived to adulthood. So needless to say, Helen Hunt Jackson was very, very filled with grief during this time period. And a way to deal with this was she poured herself into her writing. She published her early week, her, this early work anonymously using that name HH that I just said. And her first successful poem was called Coronation, which um, her first successful published poem was called Coronation, which appeared in the Atlantic. Um, she actually um, spent a lot of time uh, publishing with the Atlantic and the Century and the Nation and Independence. So she was widely published and by the 1870s, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was kind of like the person you wanted to impress in um, the literary world during the era, um, he named her the best contemporary woman poet. Um, and he included five of her poems in Parnassus, an anthology of poetry in 1880, which was kind of like the who, who's who of poets in America during that time period. Um, she had a very different idea about publication and um, being and, and receiving money for a publication than someone who, like Emily Dickinson, was mo more focused on her craft and publication was not as important to her. So Helen Hunt Jackson wrote to her friend um, James Fields, who was a publisher, I never write for money, I write for love. Then after it is written, I print for money. Cash is a vile article, but there is one thing viler, and that is a purse without any cash in it. <laughs> So she was very clever. Um, and because of this, she was able to make a living as a writer, which is a big deal. Um, over the next two years, she published three novels in the anonymous No Name series, which was a really popular um, publishing series during this era. Um, and these included Mercy Philbrick's Choice, which was published in 1886, and Hetty's Strange History in 1877. Um, both are available on um, Project Gutenberg if you're interested in checking them out. She also encouraged a contribution from Emily Dickinson to um, a collection of poems called A Mask of Poets, which were also anonymous. Um, and she was able to completely support herself off of her writing. So her second marriage, um, at the point that she was at um, when she was publishing in um, the anonymous uh, series, she did not want to get married again because she was self-sufficient and she didn't see a reason to get married because in this time period, if you got married, you lost a lot of your freedom. However, in the winter of 1873 and 1874, she, she traveled to Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado, at the resort of Seven Falls because um, she came down with tuberculosis, which was you know, how her mother died. So she was probably pretty terrified about um, dying from this disease. So, the, the cure was to go to a place like Colorado where the air was uh, drier um, and there was less, um, uh, they, people thought there was less infection. So people go to deserts, like you see a lot of people go to um, New Mexico during this time period and a little after um, in order to recover from tuberculosis. Because there really was no cure, it was called, you know, you just go there and, and relax and breathe the air basically until you got better. But while she was there, um, 
she met this uh, Quaker banker who was also a railroad executive and really, really rich, and his name was William Sharpless Jackson. So she agreed to marry him because he agreed not to interfere with her writing life. Um, and they married in 1875, and she took the name Jackson, which is a big, a bold move for somebody who's published a lot under, um, she was publishing under HH before this, but now she, she started publishing under Helen Hunt Jackson. Um, and that's what she's best known for, um, for her writings. They settled in Colorado Springs, and that's where she spent the remainder of her life, and that's her house there. Um, and then underneath that big pile of rocks is her grave. So like I said, she communicated with um, Emily Dickinson. Um, this is during that time. Um, so she was still connected to the literary community even though she was out west in Colorado. And so here she is asking um, for uh, Emily Dickinson's um, poems to include in A Mask of Poets. She says, dear Miss Dickinson, how could you possibly have offended me? So it's in response to another letter. They corresponded um, a, a, throughout the, um, uh, their friendship, their long friendship. But there are not a lot of letters that survive, but we know that they corresponded a great deal because there's mentions of her, or um, in other letters she talks about visiting Emily Dickinson, so there's a lot of different circumstantial evidence that shows that they had a lot of um, interactions. Um, I have often and often thought of sending you a line, but there are only 60 minutes to an hour. There are not half enough. I enclose to you a circular which may interest you. When the volume of verse is published in this series, I shall contribute to it, and I want to persuade you to. Surely, in the shelter of such double anonymousness as that will be, that, that you, you will not shrink. I want to see some of your verses in print. Unless you forbid me, I will send some I have. May I? It will be some time before this volume appears. There ought to be three or four volumes of stories first, I suppose. My husband is here with me, and we are enjoying this lovely New England country, so they're back home in New England visiting from Colorado. Uh, but we shall be here only a few days longer, having the great chore of the exposition to do. The address, thank you for writing in such plain letters. Will you not send me some verses? Truly your friend, Helen Jackson. And they catch up about um, a friend, a shared friend. So this is the letter she wrote asking for Emily Dickinson to give her verses, which she did, and the verses are included in this anthology. <coughs> One of um, Dickinson's few publications, yes? Well, so you said she was like kind of an anonymous writer, like writing under a pseudonym. Was this like kind of an open secret among her friends? Because she wrote James Wilder and Emily Dickinson, and they both seem to know that she was writing. Yes, well by this time, yes, yes. She, I mean the literary salons, right, they're, they're publishing also Ralph Waldo Emerson is reading her poems aloud. Like her, her, her poems are well circulated. Remember, she's publishing in all of these big publications, and yes, people know who she is. Um, so she's anonymous, but not really. And once she gets married, she's no longer anonymous. Good question. Any, I've been saying this really fast. So, other questions about her? Yes. So you mentioned that she uh, she had perished in like a. Like a boat or something, like a crashing, sinking. That's ship? Margaret Fuller. She oh. died in a shipwreck. Yeah, yeah. That was that was the last horrible death. <laughs> that was Friday. Yeah, I know. They, we. I thought of making. You know, um, there's some children's book where it talks about everyone, everyone's death. It's like a really morbid children's book. Maybe it's not a children's book. That sounds inappropriate, but. Um, I just keep thinking every time I read about all these wonderful women, I think of making a poem about all their deaths. <laughs> it's terrible. Anyway, um, I guess I'm morbid as a biographer. A Century of Dishonor and Ramona are two of the works that he Helen Hunt um, Jackson is most famous for. Um, ooh, I changed her gender on her. She became deeply angered at the plight of indigenous people. So after she um, was living in Colorado, she became more in touch with what happened to the Plains um, indigenous people, and um, it really angered her um, what was happening. And so she started researching and writing this book, A Century of Dishonor, which she published in 1881, which was an unvarnished report of the US government's longstanding betrayal of indigenous people. It's pretty out there for her time. 
And then she wrote in a fictional for form um, Ramona, which is uh, it became a bestseller, like an ultra bestseller. Like it was reprinted over 300 times. Um, and as she said, I did not write Ramona. It was written through me. My life, my life, lifeblood went into it. Is what it says. Helen Hunt Jackson. So um, this here is a manuscript for Ramona uh, that she first wrote, and it is, it is a, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a story. It's a story of an indigenous person told through Helen Hunt's, uh, Helen Hunt Jackson's um, point of view. Um, so it is a bit romanticized, uh, but it, it really appealed to the public during the time period. And so it got, people who read Ramona would often also read A Century of Dishonor, which was more factual. And so it brought this idea of um, what was happening to indigenous culture in the West um, to, um, to the East Coast and to the literary establishment. Uh, there is a link here to um, Ramona, if you're interested in reading part of it, it's an interesting read. I always like to give you more information than you can possibly read. Yes? Was Ramona turned into a play, or am I mixing that up with something else? So there's another, there's another, story, there's another book called Ramona, but that's um, Beverly Clearly. Right, like a children's oh, book? No, Ramona? No, no, no. Oh. no, no, not that. Not your Ramona. Okay, I was like, no, 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 that, that was not the same one, yeah. <laughs> so that'd be oh, funny, that though. Be really funny. No, uh, there's a play called Ramona, and I was wondering if it was based on this. I don't know. And, that's, and it's not based on the Beverly Hills. Is that, yeah. <laughs> it should be, though. It should be. Okay. Well, yeah, no, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, let me know if you find out. Okay, so I want to start with her. This is not in the packet, but this is like the greatest hit. Like, you can still see this poem anthologized today. Um, it's called Poppies in the Wheat, and it's from her collection independent of 1870, it was published in 1870. So if we go back to these dates, what was happening to her in 1870? She was in Colorado. She's not in Colorado yet. She is killing it as a writer at this point. Like this is her like peak of celebrity before she becomes peak of celebrity for um, Ramona. So this is her peak of HH celebrity, okay? Okay, this is Poppies in the Week. Along Anaconda's hills, the shimmering heat, a tropic tide of air with ebb and flow, bathes all the fields of wheat until they glow like flashing seas of green which toss and beat around the vines. The poppies life and fleet seem running, fiery torchmen to and fro to mark the shore. The farmer does not know that they are there. He walks with heavy feet, counting the bread and wine by autumn's gain. But I, I smile to think that days remain, perhaps to me in which, though bread be sweet, no more and red wine warm my blood in vain, I shall be glad remembering how the fleet, like poppies, ran like torchmen with the wheat. So what's going on in this poem? On its surface read, what are you seeing? She's looking at a wheat field, right? Are you with me? Yes? And what does it look like to her? Like it's on fire. Like it's on fire, yeah. And it's, a, it's also um, seas of green, right? Like it's, it's um, have you ever seen a wheat, anyone ever seen a wheat field before? A few people? Good, okay. So. When it's in the wind, right, it looks like a sea, okay? It looks like a sea, and so she's talking about that movement. She's also talking about um, how the sun glinting off of it is making it fiery, right? And she's talking about um, fiery torchmen. What does that mean? What do you think she's talking about in regards to that? What does that image mean? It is a metaphor, just so you know. There's not really men with torches in the fields. Good, yes. So the poppies are these 
fiery glints in the sun, right, that are in this field, right, that are standing out. And when the farmer sees, when the farmer walks through the field, what does the farmer see? Sometimes we make the symbol for it. Money, right, that's his crop, turns it over, he's gonna make some money. What it, but she's thinking, oh, but wait, don't do it yet, because look, it's so pretty, I can look at it a little bit longer. That's what's happening, that's the suspense that she's playing with in this poem. Okay, so she sees this, these fields of wheat, she sees the beauty, she's in, she, she doesn't want it to go away, and even though she loves bread, who doesn't? Even though she loves red wine, right? She says, she would give that, she doesn't, that's not as important as what she sees in the natural beauty around her. Okay? Yes? Are there actual pockets of it, or? Um, I believe there are. The poppies, life and fleet, seem running fiery torchmen. Okay, it doesn't so, make sense, I feel like, for wheat and poppies to be in the same place. What's that? Poppies? Yeah. Well, the poppies, I think, are just, um, they're just here and there, right? Poppies are a wild flower, so they're going to be popping up. Poppies will be popping up, right, all over the fields, right? She's in, she's, um, we don't know where she is exactly, actually, in 1870. Yeah. Do you understand? Like, there's just yeah. flowers coming up everywhere. We wouldn't have the pesticide back then to suppress. Oh yeah, so yeah, there's there's stuff wheat. growing in the wheat. It's not just wheat. So now, if you see a field of wheat, it's just wheat because everything else is killed. But then there was lots of stuff, including bugs. Yes. Very good, thank you for seeing that. Go ahead, great observation. Yes? Yeah, I agree, I see it as like she notices the poppies as a source of beauty in the fields, but they're not the cash crop there, so when it's time for harvest, like the weed's gone, like the poppies are gonna maybe die or be cleared with it, so if you're converting it to money, then in turn you kind of lose like a little bit of like the beauty in it, so maybe that's kind of like similar to how she thought about like publishing her writing, she said that she does it for love, but then publishes her money. Because she likes bread and wine, too. Yeah. Good. Very good. Yeah. Also, as a comment, I like how she compares, like, the coffee store and the meat, and the heat she gets on the sea. Yeah. Very good. I like how everyone's talking now, too. This is making my day. I, I was going to say something similar, where it seems like she's making these poppies into, like, a kind of, like, a fighting figures, because it says, like, you know, like, like, um, our classmate said like um like a fleet but then also fiery torchmen so it's making it seem like as if, like you know they're being rebellious right and it's like and then i also what stood out to me was like you know the farmers like heavy feet so i feel like if you have if you ever see some like really like freshly trimmed gla gr grass or something and then you imagine someone stepping on it and almost like hurts yeah so i almost feel like it's kind of like um like nature's fighting back, like it's not passive, right? Good. So I like that. Yes. Um, I think it's interesting how the meter is cut up right at to mark the shore. And Good. It interrupts the ten syllable pattern and also interrupts the rhyme scheme, and it very much like feels like if we're taking kind of this beauty of this sonnet-like structure and abruptly cutting off it off. That's kind of exactly what the farmers do. Like of this image of this beautiful landscape. Very good, yes, because form was really important to Helen Hunt Jackson. So when she's messing with it, we gotta pay attention. Very good. You guys, you're talking, making my day. Okay, I wanna look a little bit at Emma Gravit, which is a sonnet, more formal sonnet. Um, this is in the packet. Um, it's from um, the Latin, he or she who leaves. Also the word immigrant comes from it. Who would like to read this? New voice, who hasn't read yet? Would you like to read? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. 
With sails full set, to shift her anchor ways, strange names shine out beneath her figurehead. What glad farewells with eager eyes are said, what cheer for him who goes, and him who stays. Fair skies, rich lands, new homes, and untried days. Some go to seek, the rest but wait instead, watching the way wherein their comrades led, until the next stanch ship her flag doth raise. Who knows what myriad colonies there are, of fairest fields and rich, undreamed of games. Thick planet in the distant, shining plains, which we call sky because they lie so far. Oh, <coughs> write me, not died in bitter pain, but emigrated to another star. Isn't that a great last line, you guys? Mm -hmm. I want to emigrate to another star. That's so cool. All right, let's talk about it. I put the syllabics on there. There's one line that's just a little, you could read it as an 11, but it's probably when you said it aloud, it would be a 10, you know? Um, but I always like to pay attention to those because it could be a point where we're supposed to pay attention in the poem. So what do you guys think of this poem? What's going on? Yes? I kind of like to think of it as her first marriage with her first husband. The, uh the somewhat military men traveling on Beyonce's and whatnot, probably like her free will to, uh, I don't know, seeing him go overseas. And just like, you know, the, uh, the thought process that she goes through uh, as, uh, as he immigrated to a, another star. It's honestly a really nice description. As a, as, a, as a metaphor for death? Is that what you mean? I mean, I, you could say that. I was thinking more of just like... Because he was killed by a torpedo, right? So I was just thinking of it more broadly as like visiting a different location that like okay. someone hasn't visited before. Okay, yeah. So it's like they're in America, so they're probably going to Europe or Asia or Africa. Right, good, good. This poem is also like really American. You have like this American idea of almost like empire where you're going to where like you perceive the grass is greener. I think of like... The expansion to the west, like the wagons, that whole movement? Very much so, yeah. We have to read this under Turner's thesis, right? Everyone aware of Turner's thesis? He was the guy that was like, we're going to go west and conquer everything, and that's the American dream, right? Bad plan. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was just looking at, like, so the ship is uh, her, um, but then all of the people on the ship are to as male, and so I was like looking at, well, it's like the men who are free to travel and go about, um, but they still need like the feminine ship to convey them, but the ship itself has no real agency. Good, I like that reading. Very good. Do we have a hand over here? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of morbid, but I do agree with the reading um, where the last line seems to resemble line that we can read metaphorically, right, of, of her personal story. Go ahead, Connie. Well, I just wanted to point out that in the packet, it seems that one of the lines that's up there is missing mm -hmm. from the printed version, and it's not one that got cut off in the copying or anything, because it's like right in the middle. One of the lines is missing in yeah. the packet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's after um, some go to seek the rest, but wait instead. I'm watching the way where their comrades led is not in the packet. It's not yeah. there. So Okay, wait, so what line is it? What what number? Uh, seven. Yeah, it's only 13 lines in here. Oh my gosh, it's a typo in the anthology. So I wanted to point that out in case anybody... Everybody write in that line, I'm so sorry. I didn't, wanted, I didn't catch that. Yeah, if anybody wanted to use this poem in the paper, that... Yeah, please definitely right. use the sonnet. It is out the comrades of the No, this is this is a uh, that's just a typo. It's 
So here you go. This is what happens in books. There's typos. <coughs> Not a typo on the slide, you guys. This is the correct version. It's just a typo in the anthology. So now that you know it's a sonnet, um, what do we know happens in a sonnet? What are the things that happen? We know it's 14 lines, right? Often 10 syllables per line. Do you guys remember me telling you about a volta or a turn? Yes, okay. So what's the volta or turn in this sonnet? Guesses are totally okay. Yes? Uh, I'm believing it's the line, who knows what mirrored how many there are because of the like change in number of like syllables. Good. I like that. I like that theory. That's the one I would go with too. Because when there's a there's a change of point of view or there's a change in form, that's signaling to us as a reader that we should pay attention. Something is shifting in the poem. You also have a, a shift here, right, to things that are undreamed of gains, distant shining planes, right? These unreachable places, the shining star, right? That I mean the the, the star that um, the person who's being addressed emigrated to, right? These far off places. Good. Yes. I would want to say it's the uh, line right above, which I think is kind of filled with a little bit of doubt. It's until the next star sh ship, her flag dot rise. Wait. Raise. Raise. Right. It's like building up to like the question because who knows what weird colonies there are. That's like a question she's asking, right? And the line previously is her like reaffirming her doubt where it's like, wait a second. Because above that, it's watching the way where it's their comrades leave, kind of like a somewhat confident line where she's like restating that it's like, yeah, these our comrades gonna lead into overseas and yeah. see it to it, our American morals and whatnot. And then she like goes into doubt like slowly in that line which is reinforced with who knows what the American colonies there are. Good, very good. Yeah? Um, I would think it's like right before the last two lines, because a lot of sonnets do that, where they have the, the last two lines be changed. I don't know do you know what kind of sonnet does that? It's a guy that wrote Romeo and Juliet. Shakespearean, Shakespearean yes. Um, and it has like quotations in it, which is different than the rest. Good, I like that. So, it, and it's it's more like a direct address as well. So you could say that that is a turning, a change in point of view in the poem, and that would be a, a, a reason for a volta, right? Good. See how there's many correct um, answers to this question? And um, whoever was saying that the of Ferris, um, who knows what myriad colonies there are, that is a, where the Petrarchian sonnet would break. So if this is more a Petrarchian um, off of the poet Petrarch, who originated the sonnet but didn't quite originate it. Um, good. Good job, you guys. What did you reading poems? Okay, we're gonna end with opportunity also from the handout. Hopefully, hopefully it's the same. We'll find out. This is a good test. Um, I do not know if climbing some <coughs> hill through fragrant wooded paths, this glimpse I bought, or whether in some midday I was caught to upper air, where visions of God's will in pictures to our quickened sense fulfill his word. But this I saw, a path I sought, the wall of rock, no human fingers wrought, the golden gates which opened sudden still and wide. My fear was hushed by my delight, surpassing fair the lands my path lay plain. Alas, so spellbound, feasting on the sight, I paused that I but reached the threshold bright, when swinging swift, the golden gates again were rocky wall by which I wept in vain. This is fully metaphoric, you guys. 100% metaphor sonnet. Yes? Um, I like the, the gap in like, this word, but this is not, and then a path I sought. There's like, she, sh she could have combined it and it would have like the same sound effect, but there's like a literal path that you could see going straight through the poem. 
Yes. White Gatsby's. Very good. I like how you're visually looking at the stuff on the page. Yes. Yeah, I would like to change this a lot faster. Um, I just have an agenda, um, and there's a lot more uh, enjoyment, um, and a lot more alliteration, which makes it like feel like you're, I don't know, like kind of like going past fairly quickly and in a happy sense, so you get a form of like elation on your reading. Good. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Like, it's very full compared to the Emily Dickinson poems. Oh, yeah. She's not taking stuff out, right? She's very grammatically sticking to it. She's not sticking grammatical, like, blowing up grammar for her own sake, right? Very good. But they're also, they're both very formal as poets, right? Just in very different ways. Um, I don't know, like, who already said this, but, like, there's space in the Yes. Because it like stops in the middle and then the next one starts in the middle. Exactly. So it's like, isn't this as I thought I saw it best with the path starting from this word? Good. Yeah, I like that. That's a really good that's a really good point to point out. Anyone else have observations about opportunity? What about the metaphor of it? What is the what is the thing she's claiming? Yes. So it seems like um the first like stanza is about kind of like God's will and kind of God's like plan in a way, right? It's what like she's saying and then it's like I feel like what this poem is talking about is almost like the sense of like um, I guess almost abandonment perhaps, right? Because it's like the first, I think in the first stanza she's talking about feeling like she needs a guide like she needs a path, right? To be set for her, right? But then it says it, um, it says, but this is but this I saw, so it's like basically telling us like that's not what I found, right? What I found was, um, and then towards the end it says, when swinging swift the golden gates again were, were rock wall by which I wept in vain. Meaning like those like gate, I guess the gates of heaven which she expected to kind of like be open for her and maybe even bring her some sort of sense of, sense of comfort mm -hmm. are closed. So I think, I think just thinking about all of like the loss she's had in her life, that's probably, her way of expressing how it feels to have lost something so important like her children right in that moment like she doesn't feel like there's hope right good. she feels like she's been shut out good right. and there's there's our sense of control yes go ahead Yeah, it actually has, um, it's like Robert Frost maybe read this poem, I'm thinking, right? When he was thinking about two, two roads diverged in the woods. I see a little bit of a nod back to Helen Hunt Jackson. Do you guys know that poem? Heard it before? <laughs> I don't have to recite it. <laughs> Thank you. Because um, I can only hear it in his voice, because I had a record of him saying it. This is what I listened to in college. I know. That was really <laughs> uncool. But I had a record of Robert Frost reading that poem, and he's like, his voice haunts me forever and ever. Good. So I want you to pay attention. I mean, it's not good that he haunts me. Good that you guys are paying attention to this poem. I love that you're thinking about it visually, how it's breaking. I love that you're thinking about, you're going to be thinking about the rhyme scheme in this poem, right? She is a formal poet, but she's playing with form not as you know fluently or as dramatically as Emily Dickinson, but she's definitely doing that, okay? And um, mm -hmm. I see her very much as a Western writer as well. So I want you to um, pay attention to how her um, imagery shifts, right, in some of her poems from New England to um, a Western scene, which kind of like um, another poet that we read that's a Western poet, Starts with an I. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so 
I want you to see the whole array of different poets that, um, you know, not the whole array, but many of the poets that um, were writing during this period. Um, I don't think we have time to do solitude. I wanted to talk about solitude. But um, another poem in the packet is Solitude, which is um, a definition poem. So it's her version of a definition poem. And it's a conversation with solitude. So pay attention to that maybe in um, contrast to maybe how Emily Dickinson might have written this poem, right? Which is quite different. Um, on um, Wednesday, the person we're going to be looking at in depth is Emma Lazarus. Um, I will be talking about some of these other poets in between a little bit. I know I said we would talk about Louise May Alcott today, but um, I want to focus in on, there's so much to say on Helen Hunt Jackson, um, and Louisa May Alcott comes a little bit later. But um, she will come into play. We are not reading any of her novels, even though um, especially her early novels are extraordinary, but Little Women is you know, always a great stirred up kind of novel. Um, I would love to have you for a whole year, and all we read is women from the 1800s, but I know nobody's going to sign up for that class. Okay, but on Wednesday, come having, here's what I want from you. I'm going to ask you to please, it's not a lot of prep work, I want you to actively read all of the poems by Emma Lazarus so you feel really confident talking in class so we can practice that, okay, just so that... Um, I want you to be able to, to talk to me about what you're finding so I know you're ready to write this paper. Another thing is if you are struggling with um, the topic that you want to write about, the two poets you want to pair, so I mean the poet you want to pair with Emily Dickinson, please come see me after class and I'm happy to talk to you. Um, also, if you didn't get the copy of, um, you want to write about Ina Colbreth and you would like to borrow my copy of her biography, I have it in my office. If you're interested in borrowing it, I just do need it back. So that's it for today. Thank you guys for interacting so much. <laughs>